Welcome class, this is Dr. Severin. In this series of lectures, we're gonna be discussing sleep health. Sleep has grown to become a bit of a hot buzz topic within healthcare, especially within the physical therapy profession. Um, we're really looking at it as a, a marker and a, a modifier for a variety of different diseases. Um, and we'll kind of get into some of the basics of physiology and um, how we can assess these, you know, different disorders or just sleep quality overall, um, and then how we can potentially improve it. So the objectives for today, for this lecture, will be to discuss normal sleep parameters, normal sleep physiology, um, get an, uh, an understanding of quality of sleep and quantity of sleep. They're a little bit different. Um, we'll go over some of the impacts of disturbed sleep on health, and we'll get into a little bit of sleep disorders versus disturbed sleep. There is a bit of a difference there. And we'll get into assessments and then, again, interventions for how to improve sleep. Now, I just want to give you guys some perspective, again, of how impactful sleep is to our lives, just an overall perspective. Um, we spend about a third of our lives sleeping. Again, if you think about we should be spending between seven, eight hours uh, per day sleeping, um, that's a third of, of a day. So if we do that every day throughout our lives, um, that's a third of your of your time on this planet. So, you know, if you look at anything that you do that frequently, it's going to have major impacts on, on your life, right? On your overall um, health. And again, sleep has an important role in the optimal function of pretty much every body system. We'll go over some of the big ones, the immune system, the cardiovascular system. Um, but again, it's, it's huge. It's how our body recovers. It's how we uh, kind of prepare ourselves for the next day and the stressors that we may encounter. It's our, it's our you know, refresh button basically for each day. So again, sleep is not a passive process. Like it, the way we may be sleeping and resting, there's a, a myriad of different physiological systems that are repairing, that are refreshing, that are kind of kicking on um, that, uh, you know, don't even, aren't even active when we're awake or really not active at all. So, um, again, it's, it's a very physiologically active process in the body. It plays a major role in tissue healing, immune function, um, neural function as well. You know, we see increased secretions of various endocrine hormones, of big ones, HGH, again, which is huge for remodeling and recovery and repair. We see an enhanced lymphocyte uh, production and antibody synthesis. It's really important for our innate immunity to be adequately rested. It's how we kind of prepare antibodies um, that to protect against various infections we may be encountering throughout the day, um, as well as memory consolidation. It's a, you know, one of the other kind of big factors there. Um, it's where we kind of consolidate, process the information that we receive throughout the day um, and start getting into the, the processes of learning. So like, you know, realistically, um, you know, the, the you know, learning is, is heavily dependent upon uh, sleep and adequate sleep. Um, and again, you know, we focus a lot on the brain, um, obviously, when we sleep. There's a lot kind of going on there, and even a lot of the sleep processes are kind of med are mediated through what happens in the brain. And the brain, obviously, is kind of the control system for our entire body. So I do want to stress uh, the importance of this uh, glymphatic system, which is basically the glial lymphatic system. So cerebral spinal fluid uh, that's in your, you know, that is in your cranium, that surrounds your brain, uh, also acts uh, as the lymph of the brain. And we're learning this now. Uh, imaging experiments have identified that cerebral spinal fluid um, entering and flowing through the brain drains into the same ducts of the lymphatic system, and it's kind of mediated through these um, glial cells um, within the brain. So, um, and this is really important because cerebral uh, spinal fluid mobilizes and moves like through this uh, glymphatic system. Um, a lot of the toxins and the waste that, you know, get maybe accumulating throughout the day. Um, a big one is amyloid beta, which is linked to Alzheimer's disease, memory loss, Parkinson's even. And we're finding that uh, this, you know, we mobilize a lot of this uh, during sleep through this glymphatic system. In fact, the lymphatic system is almost completely disengaged when we're awake. We, we do most of this during our sleep. So you know, we, we use this construct of sleep hygiene. Uh, sleep hygiene is brain hygiene, right? It's where our, our brain kind of refreshes, moves the waste that, that accumulates throughout the day. And we're finding that perhaps uh, disruptions to this glial um, lymphatic or um, glymphatic system may set the stage for um, various neurological conditions. Again, the big ones, Alzheimer's um, and potentially Parkinson's disease because of the amyloid beta 
accusation. And we know that this gets moved out of it during sleep. So a lot more uh, kind of coming from that uh, area of research. This is just an example of the, the, the lymphatic system of the memory. So the sleep-wake uh, system. So it's regulated by the interplay of two major processes. And again, we're not going to dive super deep into the physiology because it's a whole area of physiology and medicine unto itself, but just to give you guys a basic understanding. So uh, it's regulated by two major processes, our process S, which promotes sleep, and process C, which pr promotes wakefulness. Process S is the homeostatic drive for sleep, um, which kind of ramps up throughout the day and peaks just before uh, bedtime at night and then like dissipates kind of throughout the night as we begin to sleep. Uh, process C, again, is the wakening pr um, promoting process and it's regulated by the circadian um, rhythm circadian system and again process c builds up through the day to kind of counteract the process of s and promote wakefulness and alertness so they're kind of in balance with each other process s which promotes sleep and the process c which promotes wakefulness uh, process s is regulated heavily by uh, neurons within the hypothalamus we'll go over some big ones in a bit that kind of shut down arousal systems again this kind of you know ramps up closer to we get to, to nighttime and um, it, what it does basically inhibits or slows down neural communication which kind of allows the brain to fall asleep right less arousal um, we actually are finding that loss of some of these nerve cells in the hypothalamus other areas may actually contribute to ins insomnia right so in, in the absence of that we would see profound uh, insomnia um, and it's also important to note that process C, like while promoting wakefulness, um, actually helps consolidate sleep and the sleep and wake si cycles into very distinct episodes, the cycles. Again, we, we need these in balance with each other. We, need, we don't want to be asleep all day. We don't want to be awake kind of all day, right? So the synchronization, you know, mediated through the circadian system helps keep sleep and wakefulness kind of coordinated with light and dark cycles. So morning and, and night. And we'll talk about kind of how that works in a bit. Um, it's kind of interesting to note that um, you know, wakefulness generated by like, um, you know, ascending arousal that we kind of, you know, again, experience, especially as we get closer to the morning when we have more light, um, acclimation. And then if we don't have process C, um, again, this wakefulness, we would still sleep, but we would find that, um, the, um, you know, we'd have normal, we total, total sleep time would be the same and you still have process S but it would be randomly distributed throughout the day. And again, so while process C, we think about wakefulness, it, it's part, it's pretty important for regulating sleep. And again, in those distinct episodes and that cycling, um, the sleep wake cycle is critically important. And we'll talk about that here with our circadian rhythms, um, which are the kind of the process which controls the sleep wake, uh, sleep wake cycle. So your circadian rhythms regulate pretty much everything in your body, um, physical activity, food consumption, um, you know, over the course of the day, your body temperature, we'll go over that, like how that changes kind of during um, the day and, and during sleep, uh, heart rate, muscle tone, and hormone secretion. Uh, these rhythms are generated uh, by neural structures, again, in the hypothalamus, which is linked to a lot of different autom automatic processes within our body um, that kind of, you know, these, these, these rhythms, these neural structures create what we call the biological clock. Uh, there's three main kind of locations that are involved with sleep. Uh, the suprachiasmic nucleus, so the SCN, which regulates pretty much all circadian rhythms, you know, including sleep, um, the dorsal medial nucleus, and the pineal gland. So the, the uh, SCN receives direct inputs from a, a ton of different cells, but importantly for sleep, it receives inputs directly from uh, the retina. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, and these brightness detectors kind of help you know, reset the, the cycles each day. Uh, the SEN, they transmits like signals throughout the body. So uh, basically the way it kind of breaks down, the dorsal medial nucleus receives information from neurons and hormones involved in different processes. It passes that all information on the SEN, which then projects outputs to the rest of the body. So the SEN is kind of setting the pace, and then there's all these different relays that occur through the dorsal medial nucleus in the hypothalamus as well. As well. Um, in terms of um, hormones kind of involved with sleep, uh, the pineal gland, which receives projections from the SCN, um, you know, when you get closer to nighttime, um, we start secreting more melatonin, which it is kind of kind of brings us um, into a, a sleepier state. So that again, that's how you know, our environmental um, inputs um, you know, affect our sleeping and waking cycles. And that's kind of why managing the amount of darkness and light that we have when we sleep is really important because 
these are all kind of regulated uh, with each other. So again, uh, super triastic nucleus, again, not going to go over super deep into the, um, you know, physiology again, we, you know, we, we have direct neural inputs from the retina. So you have all those photoreceptors, light receptors that get sent um, to the, uh, this nucleus that kind of let us know that, hey, it's, it's light time or hey, it's nighttime. So, you know, if we get a lot of light signaling for, you know, morning hours, we should start being the ramping up to arousal and awake and wakefulness. If we have less light, we should be getting, you know, prepared for sleep, right? And melatonin secreted. Um, again, the SCN then transmits signals throughout the rest of the body um, to help everything stay coordinated with this day to night cycle. So we can coordinate, you know, wakefulness and sleep to nighttime and daytime. And a lot of what happens with sleeping disorders um, and even just disturbed sleep is there's a, a breakdown of the cycle, right? So again, if we have you know, everything kind of working in, in you know, optimal function, um, you know, nighttime is balanced, you know, is, is in sync with when we go to sleep and, you know, morning time is kind of when we wake up, right? So that's the physiology, uh, or the neurophysiology of sleep. In the next uh, section, we'll get into the different phases of sleep and some of the physiological processes that we observe uh, during a night's sleep.